Hi, everybody. We're going to get started in just a minute or two. Um, right now, we're letting everyone into the, the webinar. Uh, if you do have any issues, uh, just type your problem into the chat box and we'll try to get it addressed. But we should be starting in just a minute or two. Thanks. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. <clears throat> good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Chris Bonamy. I am the Deputy Director for the DuPage County Stormwater Management Department, and we are here for a water quality webinar that will cover a water quality retrofit project that the City of Elmhurst implemented at its Arlington Reservoir. The project involved basin regrading, vegetation establishment, retaining wall replacement, SCADA uh, integration, and driveway improvements all through design build services. Uh, so it should be very interesting. Uh, this is a free webinar and uh, one PDH, one professional development hour will be available. We have several of these workshops throughout the year. Uh, we find that they're a great way to connect like-minded organizations and individuals who are concerned with the water quality in DuPage County's uh, local lakes, rivers, and streams. Uh, these workshops also uh, help us with our public outreach and education programs and help us meet requirements uh, set forth in our ILR 40 permit with the uh, Illinois Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, the webinar is being recorded. So if you know of others who can't be with us today and might benefit from, from this information, we will provide a link uh, to that recorded presentation, uh, uh, to the recorded presentation shortly following our program today. Uh, before we begin, just a couple thank yous. Uh, thank you to Mary Mitros. She is the county's stormwater communications supervisor and she's running our show today. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Conservation Foundation. Uh, they are our partners for all of these webinars and workshops, uh, specifically Jan Rail. Uh, she's the DuPage County Program Director for the Foundation. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our speakers, uh, Kent Johnson from the city of Elmhurst and Colin McDonald, McConnell, I'm sorry, and Matt, Matthew Moffitt from uh, Baxter and Woodman are with us today. So thank you to them. And once again, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. A uh, couple more quick comments here. I just wanna say happy holidays to everyone. Uh, I hope everyone has a very stress-free holiday season. Uh, I tend to get a little stressed out uh, and anxious uh, during the holidays, trying to pick out the perfect gifts for people, uh, especially my wife. Uh, so this year I tried to make it easy. I bought a world map, gave my wife a dart and said, wherever that dart lands, that's where we're going to go uh, for vacation over the holidays. And turns out <clears throat> we'll be spending two weeks behind the fridge. Two weeks behind the fridge. Uh, she's not real good with the hand-eye coordination anymore. But anyway, uh, uh, I do hope that everyone has a very happy, healthy, and safe holiday season this year. And speaking of gifts and presents, we have a great presentation for you today involving 
a water quality retrofit to the Arlington Reservoir, as well as restoration and maintenance practices for naturalized areas. Uh, but before I introduce our speakers, I do want to remind everyone that you are muted. So if you do have comments or questions during the presentation, please type those directly into the chat box and we will relay those on to the speakers at the end of the presentation. Uh, and one other note, uh, the audience is responsible for their own video camera. So whether you want that on or off is totally up to you. All right, so let me get these uh, speakers introduced. I'm gonna start with Kent Johnson. Kent is a professional engineer and certified floodplain manager who has been with the city of Elmers for 13 and a half years, uh, acting as the city engineer for the last eight years. He holds a bachelor and master's degree in civil engineering from the University of North Dakota. Kent currently manages the engineering department for the city of Elmhurst, which is comprised of nine staff members. His department is responsible for annual capital projects involving roadways, uh, resurfacing and reconstruction, water main replacements, and various other infrastructure improvements. Most notably, uh, the city has spent over 40 million um, in design and construction of stormwater projects since 2015 to reduce urban overland stormwater flooding throughout the city. Uh, in total, 13 projects have been constructed throughout the city to date, and they have collectively created approximately 128 acre feet of new detention to reduce structural flooding. Kent is an active member of the Chicago Metro chapter of the American Public Works Association and the IAFSM, the Illinois Association of Floodplain and Stormwater Managers. Kent currently serves uh, as the uh, incoming uh, treasurer for the suburban branch of the APWA and uh, also the branch, the branch's golf committee chairman. Uh, so Kent uh, is not with us here in person, but he is part of the video recording, uh, the video presentation rather. So uh, thank you for Kent for doing that. Uh, I also want to introduce uh, Colin McConnell, McConnell, Colin McConnell, let me say that again. Colin is the natural resource department manager at Baxter and Woodman Natural Resources. Colin has over 23 years of experience in environmental assessments and monitoring, wetland delineations, restoration design, stormwater pollution prevention plans, construction, and prescribed burns. He has designed and constructed a variety of sustainable solutions such as porous pavers, native plantings, bioswales, rain gardens, wet bottom detention basins, and stream bank stabilization projects. His expertise in erosion control and soil stabilization encompasses traditional method, methods such as silt fencing, erosion control blankets, as well as geowebbing and geogrid paths. Colin works uh, closely with various regulatory agencies, including the Army Corps of Engineers and the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Uh, and so Colin, thank you for joining us. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Matthew Moffitt. Matthew is a professional engineer and also a certified floodplain manager. Uh, his, uh, he uh, first found his passion for water resources growing up along the banks of the Mississippi River in Nauvoo, Illinois. And that passion only grew as he attended the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, Matt has been with Baxter and Woodman for eight years and now leads the Water Resources Group. He also sits on the board of directors of Baxter and Woodman Natural Resources, is a trustee for the Palatine Rural Fire Protection District, and is the vice president of APWA's Suburban Branch. So, uh, Matthew, thank you for being with us. Uh, right now, Mary, why don't we, why don't we turn it over to Matt and uh, he'll get the, uh, the presentation started. Thank you, Chris. Can you guys confirm that you can see the slides now? Yes, we can. All right, uh, Kent does uh, regret not being able to come. Um, APWA scheduled their annual Chris or holiday party today after this was already scheduled. Uh, Kent and I drew straws and he got to go to the boozy lunch and I got to be here with all of you guys. So I think I won, but uh, he's recorded here. So we'll, I'm gonna press play, go through his slides and then I will jump in. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Ken Johnson with the City of Elmhurst and I'm happy to be here today presenting the Arlington Reservoir Retrofit and Maintenance Webinar. 
along with Matt and Colin from Baxter Woodman Natural Resources. Special thank you to the Conservation Foundation and DuPage County Stormwater for helping put this together. A little project background. Um, today we're going to be talking about the Arlington Reservoir. Sorry, I just realized you see my presenter mode. Let me try to get you on the big screen here. Full screen. Do you have the full screen now? Yeah, it looks good. All right. Sorry Which about that. The city of Elmhurst. It is along I-294 and just north of I-290 and North Avenue. It's a regional uh, detention facility. A little background on this particular project. Um, this project lies within the Addison Creek watershed. And in the uh, mid 70s, the state of Illinois started looking at ways to improve uh, watershed management uh, due to flooding that occurred along Addison Creek. And as you can see by the blue dots on the screen, uh, the city of Elmhurst Arlington Cemetery Reservoir it's just one of several uh, detention facilities, if you will, that help with flood mitigation along this watershed. A little bit more background. Uh, around 1980, the state commissioned a uh, engineering design for the construction of the Arlington Cemetery Reservoir, um, again in Elmhurst, and it was constructed, I believe, in the late 80s and early 1981. Currently, the facility has a uh, storage of 65 acre feet, uh, so it's a pretty big facility. There's two points of entry for stormwater to get into the basin. You can see from the red arrows in the upper right and upper left hand corner. And after the water comes in, um, it often does sit for quite a long time. And over the years, a lot of sediment has built up in the bottom because the entire bottom of the facility is completely flat. Uh, but ultimately, the water does get pumped out and follows the green arrow path that you see on your screen. Uh, the city has a pump station that we uh, maintain uh, that discharges into storm sewer, and then eventually that storm sewer heads east into Cook County and on its way to Addison Creek. So uh, why did the city of Elmhurst need to do this project in the current time? Well, the adjacent property owner, which is Mathar, uh, a large facility in the city of Elmhurst, a large company, um, they were doing a, a massive expansion in their building. Because the expansion was so big, they really didn't have room in their site to do the required stormwater best management practices that they had to do per uh, city code and DuPage County stormwater ordinance. So the city collected a fee of over $200,000 uh, for this BMP fee in lieu of and um, the city followed DuPage County's fee in lieu of calculation. And we knew we wanted to do something in the uh, immediate area to, to improve water quality. And that's what really precipitated us uh, starting this project and talking to Baxter and Woodman. So with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Matt from Baxter and Woodman. He's gonna get into the uh, details of the project. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so. Uh, talking with Kent and, and other staff with the city, we were um, determining how to best approach this project. They had set funds from their four water quality features um, from that fee in lieu of that Kent mentioned, um, as well as between uh, engineering and uh, public works, they had a little extra money that they thought they could add some additional improvements and uh, provide some uh, benefits to the site while we're we're on site and in these discussions and with this pretty controlled budget uh, we decided working with the city that a design build um, project delivery method would be uh, the the best fit for the project um, you know as, as we get in you know as, uh, we, we'd have to do less design uh, not spend the village's money or city's money excuse me on preparing final plans and specs and bidding and all of that save some staff time as well and um, give us our team a little more flexibility as they're in there working and potentially uncovering unknowns and whatnots that we could deliver the best project um, up to that that budget that they had um, the, our goals here with, were primarily the water quality improvements um, which we achieved with some additional and larger and additional and larger sedimentation basin. Um, we added a, a kind of treatment train long flow path for a portion of the water um, to uh, allow for additional infiltration and infiltration um, of some of that stormwater discharge. Um, 
when we got out there, the site had, was was fairly monocultured, not a, not a lot of diversity in the vegetation. So uh, we had a, a revegetation plan of the site, um, as, and we also added uh, SCADA controls to the pump station operations, which uh, we in the city felt uh, did add some water quality benefits as well as uh, some you know, operational benefits as well. I'll get into that a little more too. Uh, there's some additional site improvements I won't get into too much, but just mentioning while we were out there, uh, you know, they had a aggregate driveway that we paved with HMA. There's a couple small drop-offs or around some retaining walls up on top of the hill, um, on top of the basin where we added some bollards for safety, you know, some minor things like the new roof and on the pump house, um, you know, some minor things out of some of their other budgets. But the um, primary goal of this was the water quality and that's what we'll be discussing and presenting here. <clears throat> So uh, on these water quality methods, as I mentioned, I'm still, are you, are you guys still seeing my presenter view? Is it very small or? No, we're seeing the normal. Oh, okay. I've got a red box around the presenter view, which is confusing me. Sorry, my apologies. Um, so this is uh, our, our kind of schematic drawing of the site. You can see the, the grading coming down here. Um, I don't even remember how, deep it was, I want to say it was like, Colin, do you remember how deep this was off top of your head? 637 up to 6, is that 54, 20, 30 feet? Uh, regardless, um, so we've got we've got the basin here and as Kent had mentioned, it was a very flat bottomed basin. The red arrows are where the water's coming in. There's a, on the Northwest corner, there's a concrete sleuth that the water runs down and then a concrete uh, settling basin in the bottom. The sleuth is designed such that you could drive a skid steer up and down it. Um, there's also a kind of access road that was in poor shape here as well that they could get down. Um, as Kent mentioned, there was not a lot of maintenance going on in the bottom of this basin. Um, there's another concrete um, settling basin on the northeast corner where another um, outfall pipe entered uh, where sediment was intended to be captured. A lot of it just got flushed out, deposited into the bottom of the basin. A lot of it got pumped up. <clears throat> Uh, so what the regrading project did, um, we added a uh, several foot deep um, large retention pond. So this is a wet bottom basin here that was intended to, to capture a lot of the sediment that was um, just staying in the basin and um, not settling well and actually a lot of it getting pumped up and sent downstream. So uh, we installed this large settling basin here in addition to the uh, original concrete basins. Um, we installed a berm kind of in the middle of the site so that all of the water coming in from this, the northeast uh, outfall would have this flow train around the berm to get to the sediment basin. The um, pump station actually draws from the settling basin over here, pump stations right here next to the sleuth in the northwest corner. So everything here would go through a longer flow path where we've got a relatively flat flow path wetland vegetation, um, really providing some additional opportunities for those low flows to get filtered um, on their way to the settling basin, and then which would overflow, which overflows into the concrete basin that's connected to the pump station. Um, with the flow routing, uh, getting the SCADA system portion of it, as we discussed, so we're kind of zooming on the north, uh, bank of the reservoir here. <clears throat> the water comes in on the northwest corner, uh, flows down, and this comes in the northeast corner, flows down, gets pumped out, route around along the blue path um, per original design. At some point, uh, we believe is a public works installation, uh, they just put a, a stacked several four by four beams across the top of the, the sleuth channel here and redirected the water into a 20, the low flows into a 24 inch pipe here that would just allow the water, the, these low flows to bypass going into the reservoir. Um, you know, no sense pumping all of those low flows when the downstream um, conditions can, can handle that flow. Uh, so when we got into the site, this was the current conditions. There's a pipe connecting here. So there's a, a junction chamber here that the pump station pumps up to 
water is supposed to head east. Um, one of the problems that they had with this, though, is there's no controls on this on the pump station. It's just float controlled, um, and there is a there was a gate installed on the pipe here that connects from the upstream of the sluice to the this pipe, but it was uh, manually controlled. So what was happening was they would leave the gate open and water would flow in, low flows would come down around until um, we re that, that pipe reached capacity, then everything would overflow the weir here uh, and flow down into the pump state into the basin. Water would be coming from over here down into the basin. The water level in the basin would rise. Pump station would kick on. Some of the water would go downstream. A lot of the water though would just recirculate right back around. Um, not an incredibly efficient operation. Uh, what this led the city to frequently do is just leave this gate open and leave the pumps off, wait till well after rainstorm was finished, go out, manually close the gate and manually turn on the pumps. And then the normal and low flows would just have to be kept up with by the, um, the sump pump in the pump station or every now and then if somebody was if somebody was driving by and noticed that the basin was kind of filling up with water, they'd go out, send somebody out, and turn the pumps on. Um, so they weren't really getting the the most efficient use of their um, their reservoir, and they certainly weren't doing anything for water quality or energy uh, consumption here. As they're you know when those pumps turned on, they were having a lot of recirculation issues with uh, with the water. <clears throat> so with our SCADA, we added SCADA controls to the pump station. So, um, you know, controls the, the PLC on site connected to um, all of the city's operations um, currently by cellular, but there's uh, fiber in the works that's on the way there already by another project, but not hooked up yet. Um, the, the PLC, the controls, um, it's basically a computer in the pump station house that controls turning on the uh, sump pump on and off and turning on the primary pumps um, based on rules and input into those uh, into the computer. Um, as well as for the gate here, we put a, an actuated control, so mechanical um, motorized controls onto the, the gate that can open and close. Um, this it was a 24 inch pipe that connected from the sewer to the top of the top of the sluice um, here. And Along with that, we added uh, water level sensors um, in the wet well of the pump station um, in the downstream structure um, and several cameras around the site. So this allows the public works staff to not only um, look on their SCADA controls and, and by the you know, report see are the pumps on, are they off? What are the water levels everywhere? But if something isn't looking quite right, they can actually, without having to go out to the site, click on and see the camera views. I think, I believe there, there's a camera view of the upstream part here and another camera view from the pump looking down into the reservoir. They'll see what's going on. So how we set these controls up are the gate in, in just normal operating conditions. The pumps are off, the gate is open and uh, the sump pump is the only thing that's running um, based off of a level um, sensor. Uh, when a rainstorm comes and <clears throat> this downstream uh, pipe starts surcharging or the level of the reservoir starts rising, um, the gate will close and um, as available, the, the pumps will start pumping water out so we can start pumping sooner. Um, the downstream level monitor here, if we start having downstream surcharging situation, the pumps will turn off and wait until capacity um, is available downstream and allow us to you know, really fo fully utilize the, the detention available here um, in a efficient manner to help reduce uh, flooding throughout the municipality. And then um, once downstream capacity is available, it pumps turn back on. There's three pumps that we circulate two at a time uh, to best op operate those pumps and maintain them um, in the best working order. And as soon as the basin is fully drained and emptied, the pumps will turn off and the gate will 
the gate will open back up and the reservoir is ready for those low flow conditions again. Some photos of the site here. Um, so up ahead here, you can kind of see this concrete pillar with the brick on top. This is the pump station house um, uh, where I was talking about. Uh, you can kind of see just a little bit of the concrete sleuth and this kind of black part here is the concrete settling basin. Uh, the road to the pump station on top that we had turned to, that we installed um, a HMA asphalt driveway along. Um, nice little benefit for the city. We needed, we had a lot of work that we had to do down in the bottom. We added a new aggregate um, construction access roadway down the ramp that we left in place so that the uh, city has a nice new um, aggregate roadway down into the bottom here. And you can kind of see the reservoir. This is the beginning of the project. Really very flat, no vegetation. Um, you know, just really not a, a great uh, water quality uh, benefit here. <clears throat> As we started getting into construction, um, going and starting to strip some of the sediment away, we knew we had a good amount of sediment in there. Um, we, we realized that there was no topsoil under the sediment. Uh, we went straight from sediment to clay. Um, <clears throat> we did not, you know, this was kind of a, a smaller, you know, just quick project. Uh, you know, there's no geotechnical course and in engineering involved in this. And um, everyone involved, us and the city, you know, really expected there to be uh, topsoil under the sediment. Um, finding none, you know, being a design build project and having the flexibility and a flexible partner with the city. Um, we worked with, with Kent and, and public work staff to um, adjust some of our quantities, make sure we're getting all of the sediment out to get a good grading on the bottom. And then very fortunately, timing worked out well that the city had a um, large stormwater project an underground detention facility being construction project starting. Uh, just down the road where they were stripping a whole lot of topsoil and that contractor was intending on hauling that topsoil off miles away. Uh, the city just redirected them to this site. They brought the topsoil in. Actually, that's this bottom picture here and, and dumped this new top, the new topsoil at the bottom of the ramp where we were able to spread it out and actually bring topsoil to the site where there wasn't any before. Um, another quick mention, I discussed the uh, the concrete settling basin. This is the one in the northwest corner here. Water enters in from a pipe um, coming in through the slope here. And this is supposed to capture a lot of the sediment. Um, Public Works said they don't really clean them out very often, if ever, and there really wasn't that much sediment in it. Um, just you know, makes it evident to what we were seeing. Everything just would wash out of that and get out into the basin and sit on the bottom. And I want to mention something, Matt. There is yeah, go for it. between that. The, this is Colin, by the way. Yeah, sorry. No, I'm sorry. Hi. Um, we did all the construction work out there. The said sometime in the past, somebody put a 24 inch pipe from the spillway that Matt was just pointing out to the other spillway in the northwest corner. And so the sediment, which was supposed to be in there and over the top, that's right. And that pipe came in, the sediment went right out the pipe, right into the pump and right out. So this was not holding any sediment after a certain point. Um, and then also to note, we ended up because after we found out the sediment, we ended up hauling out um, 65 semi truckloads of sediment out of the bottom of this basin. And because of the industrial area that this basin was in, every one of them had to go to a certified landfill. And when people start dealing with these types of projects, that's going to increase the price basically 60 to $75 a truckload because of the, the testing capability. So just because we're kind of talking about this at this point, when you're starting to roll on a project like this, make sure that this to the soil can get tested at some time because that will definitely dictate the price. And then it'll also dictate the truck route and where they got to take it, which will increase the price overall. So. Great point, Colin. Uh, this picture here, uh, the blanket portion down the middle here is uh, the berm, several foot high berm that we constructed. Um, we are north looking south. So the, the inlet we were just looking at, the northeast inlet is uh, 
right off the left side of the screen. The pump station is just right off the right side of the screen. Um, so this is the berm from the north bank heading out and towards the center. Um, once complete now, uh, it, the project is complete now, uh, we'll flow from this northeast outfall will kind of fall along where that you see the bulldozer around the berm and coming in here. You can see just over the pile top so that's not been spread yet. Um, the settling base in there that was constructed. And I'll look at the next picture here. <clears throat> so this is kind of still in construction. I drew a yellow line here over this. This picture was taken in before the last picture. So the berm here is not completely constructed and we haven't had not yet seeded and blanketed it yet, but put this yellow line here or orange line showing where the berm is. Um, kind of see the, the water, we, we had a rain events re, pretty, pretty recent before this picture, water still kind of flowing through out around the berm and coming into the settling basin. Uh, this water's about two feet deep. And as the water comes in overflows um, right here um, into this is the northwest um, existing concrete settling basin that's connected to the pump station. Um, so this will provide a, a very nice facility to capture a lot of that sediment, um, especially in the low flows. Um, you know, really especially get a lot of those heavy metals out of there and hopefully be able to get a lot of the sediments before it gets in up into the pump and wash downstream with the improved access road down, um, you know, the village or the city or their um, contractor can come in when, as this fills up and doesn't hold water anymore, scrape it out or, or hopefully prior to that, drain this down and, and come in and remove sediment and um, allow this to uh, continue to function. It, you know, it is something that will have to be maintained. Um, you know, and Colin will get into that a little more here in a minute. Okay, and, to, answer, uh, to answer Mary but, Beth's Falsy's question, oh, I didn't um, <clears throat> did you lose any storage area in the basin by installing the berm? We did not. Because of the sediment removal area and removing those two to three feet of sediment to the sediment basin, we created space there and we built the berm. So we basically balanced the bottom. Um, as you can see, we with the 75 truckloads of six, I'm sorry, 65 truckloads of sediment we hauled out, we created space to put the berm in to use as a water qualifying or water quality device. Oh yeah, the re the reservoir, and, and obviously we we understand the the settling basin full of water. You know that doesn't count towards our reservoir volume. Um, so we have a, I think we have a slight increase in overall reservoir volume after the berm is added, um, not counting the volume of the settling basin because of the additional cut we did to slope down to the settling basin here. Um, here we're back at the <clears throat> overview of the whole site, our berm, the, the kind of flat area, our settling basin, our side walls. We have uh, four different types of seed mixtures were used depending on these, the, the, these different zones. And I think at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and turn over Colin. Colin, let you talk about the seed selection in these zones a little bit and continue on to your maintenance. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. So um, I, it's kind of funny that we bring this up at this particular point of, of the year because I just had um, uh, somebody ask me, they were reviewing a set of engineering plans and they had one seed mix for an entire detention basin. Um, when you see that on a set of plans, that should throw up some huge red flags because the seed mixes that we use nowadays for the native mixes, they come in variable sizes depending on solid wet to wet dry to somewhat wet to dry to dry dry. And if you have one type of seed mix on one type of detention basin design, you need to go back to that particular um, person who's laying their plans out and go, okay, this is not going to work. So because of the different types of situations on this basin, we had basically mesic dry seed along the side slopes. Um, as when we get down towards the bottom of the side slopes, we blended it more to a wet dry, which is basically the same as the berm, because we are counting for fluctuation of water at these high storm events to come up three to four feet and, and soaking the berm. The bottom of the basin is basically a wet seed mixture because of the flat the flat indication of the basin. So we are 
in all practical purposes, this is going to be moist and or wet, let's say seven to eight months out of the year, just on normal rain events. And there is constant water flowing in these spillways from areas that, as far as anybody can tell, we're not quite sure where all this water is coming from. Um, there's a lot of speculation that it's coming from other developments upstream. So there, these are constantly getting water. And now that we have found out that the bottom of this is solid clay, water infiltration doesn't really work in this bottom of this detention basin. So this is why when you start doing these types of designs, design builds or, or design bid builds, whichever you want to do it, you have to make sure that the seed that you choose matches the moisture content of what area that you are in. And this works for bioswales, this for works for rain gardens and detention basins. Um, I mean, I even spec for native prairie areas, depending on where it is on the slope, with the soil conditions, you really have to make sure that you put the seed in the right place or it's not gonna be effective. And then maintenance is gonna be a bigger issue. And that's where oh, we're gonna switch. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Just, yeah, just real quick before you go on maintenance, I. I meant to hit on mention this earlier, and you briefly hit it, but uh, just for clarity, you know, uh, I mentioned this with a Baxter Women Design Build project. Um, we we just for information, our design build team was wholly in house, so the the design and construction of this project, Colin himself led the construction of this project with our um, our construction and uh, maintenance personnel and equipment. So um, this was wholly in house meant to make that point earlier. So any questions about the construction aspects of it to Collins, the guy who built it. <laughs> All right, and we'll be working on maintaining it. And why don't I have your slides? I don't know. Bear with me, that slideshow is not the complete one. All right. One second, I've got it here. So while Matt's fine, I can, I can kind of kind of get going. Where maintenance is one of those things which is um, in a lot of these um, municipalities starting to become a lot more frequent. Um, a lot of the municipalities are starting to move from maybe turf grass because of either cost or, um, well, let's be honest, it's all because of cost, budgetary items, and and you know, so people are moving more to the native side of things. You're talking a one burn every three years, talk a couple mows, maybe some herbiciding treatment. You're basically cutting your prices for depending on the municipality area from I don't even know what it would be to mow it weekly with manpower and or fuel and or subbing that out. But so a lot of our native maintenance contracts are anywhere between 2500 to 35 to 4500 a year, depending on the site, depending on what we're doing. And so this is becoming more and more frequent. Um, and that's why we actually did this design build retrofit for Elmhurst, um, not only because of the water functioning scenario, but they wanted it to look better than what it was looking like. And with a lot of the rain events that we've been getting, a lot of the time it was really dead and it was dead halfway up the slope because of the vegetation type of scenario. So as now we move forward, these are some of the areas, obviously these are um, these are areas within subdivisions and the bottom left picture is within a detention basin in, in a municipality. So basically the municipality only needs to mow kind of the, the upland areas, which are easier right along the road, right? Basically the base and side slopes and, and the detention areas where we can manage, or there's a lot of great firms out there who can manage these as well. And um, it kind of cuts down a little bit of cost. It kind of cuts out a little bit of the worry for the municipality because they know they have a subcontractor that can handle some of this work and are knowledgeable on, on how to do these types of things. Um, you want to roll to the next slide, Matt? So when we start talking detention, we talk about Creek, we talk about a lot of these things. One of the biggest issues that we've been running into is basically erosion protection gullying along these detention bases from high these high rain events and and what we can add from going from turf grass which is the arrow on the slide that has a basically quarter inch root structure 
to basically majority of your average native species is the root zones going down almost anywhere from 12 to 36 inches, depending on the native species. That's going to hold a lot of the banks and your detention basins a lot stronger and your creeks and your streams and so forth. And by doing that, you're not going to have the sediment rolling down, which then will clog up the structures, the pipes, which will create further maintenance downstream of your of your um, of your structures. Um, not only the fact that it does look nice, the one biggest issue I have with a lot of people is it looks ugly because they don't they're used to the turf grass. They got to get used to kind of the native vegetation. But once they start seeing the flowers, you know, pop. And they tend to, you know, when we have a seed mixture that we put into these native areas, they are season specific throughout the year, which means there's 40 some species in these seed mixtures. So you're going to get flowers in the spring, you're going to get flowers over the summer, and then you're going to get flowers in the fall. And as the season rotates through, your sunflowers are going to go off, but new flowers come on. So you're going to have flowers or some type of native species throughout all three or four seasons going into wintertime. The winter thing is also the the vegetation because the grasses and, and the flowers and the forbs are so tall they almost insulate the ground protecting it from more erosion so between the root structures you almost have a nice mat on top and it even prevents even more erosion in these native areas um and as you can see on these pictures what lawn protection kind of gives you um Basically, the, the top right was a drainage swale running through a subdivision. It was at the bottom of the train, and you can see how much eroded. The gentleman, after about a month after this picture was taken, the native area, the ornamental area up in the front with that tree, it was gone. It basically took out the entire landscaped area. And then, as you can see on the pond edge, on the bottom left corner, there's no really slope anymore. That All that sediment flowed into the pond which now is on the bottom of the pond, which then loses that storage uh, capability that this basin was actually designed and built for. Um, so these are just some of the issues that we can start to improve. And I'm not saying natively seed the entire area. If you talk to a 30, 40 foot buffer, that's all you'll need to really protect a lot of these areas. Go ahead, Matt. Oh, I see some plants here. I see some questions. Um, should I just answer them as we go, or did you want to kind of answer them at the end? It's up to you, Colin. Okay. Um, do tall native plants pose any problems in checking the integrity of the structure? Not really. Basically, when you see the catch basins and the manholes and so forth, you can pick them out. And in well-maintenanced areas, if you want to inspect your structures right after the native area come, the native company comes in to do the mowing, or right after the prescribed burn, um, then you can come in and, and check all the structures and then the vegetation can grow back up over the top. Um, what are the challenges of planting seed in areas that are wet much of the time? And the techniques you, well, if it's wet most of the time, you have to pick the right season to get the seed in. Um, most of your wet seed mixtures are because they're considered wet tolerant, you can plant them in let's say June or July, they can stay dormant until the rain comes in, saturates the soils. And then because they're native, they will sustain that moisture. And as let's say August rolls in and the area that may be completely saturated might starts to dry out, that seed load will germinate during that dry time, start to grow. And once the vegetation gets established with some root zones, the next following year, it can go up and down and that that plant material will grow through the moisture and it'll grow up. And as the water level goes up and goes down, the vegetation, native vegetation will sustain itself, which is why it's really nice in these bottom of these basins. Besides the fact, some of these native vegetations actually filter out a lot of the toxins that some of our stormwater gets. So it's almost a filtration device as it goes out into streams and creeks from our detention basins. Just want to make sure I didn't miss anybody else's. Uh, what is the volume of the settling basin versus the overall volume of the basin? Well, that's more of a you, Matt, I think, based on the stormwater scenario. Maybe we'll come back and detach that at the end. Sure. Okay. So figuring out the budget and level of importance. Basically, this is scenario is 
based on your municipality size, what level of importance this, this train has within what you need, and then we will work, most municipality will work within the budget scenario. So like Elmhurst, we were working within a amount that was assisted from McMaster Car. So when we started to figure out what we were gonna do, a lot of that was based on budget. How many trucks went out, we figured within the budget. The seat and the maintenance was figured into the budget. All that was kind of figured out so that we could hit that target budget that they were working on. Um, the other type of scenario, depending on what type of maintenance you're doing, will dictate basically the, the year, the season, and, and so forth. We have a couple contracts, for example, that we have with some municipalities that we have a space over three to four or five years. Some of these types of maintenance squad, these projects like detention or ditch maintenance, they've either been let go for so long, you just can't jump right in and, and do it all at once. So what we try to do is we'll pick an order of importance about what is the most severe and then you attack those first and then maybe start doing small maintenance gradually working itself in and if you kind of work that way it'll help over a three to five year kind of project that you might be able to get back on track where then maybe it's just straight maintenance and then if something huge comes up you kind of have in, in, in a budget to attack that something huge um maintenance also is dictated by the year you do a lot of brush work in the winter uh, primarily because it's really hot to do brush, the chainsaw work, that kind of stuff. Summertime is typically maintenance uh, for, say, like spotting herbiciding for native species when they're alive. Colin, you've you start, got that in your next slides. You got eight more slides in about five to seven minutes. If you all want right, to then up. let's rock and roll because I'm a talker. So <laughs> we'll go to the next one. Here we go. So spring season, obviously everybody loves the smoke. Well, they see the smoke. They may not love it, but um native burning is is one of the big maintenance things that need to be done if you can do it if you're along 290 and i-90 i would not recommend burning but in most places that you can get away with it, if you can do some prescribed burning the spring is the best time to do it to clean off all that residue that's on top and it triggers the native species to pop a little <laughs> earlier in the year um go ahead matt roll on and some of the equipment that that you typically need, you know, obviously water is important road signs to, so that when people are stopping or slowing down to watch is usually the biggest thing. Um, there's enough road signs ahead so that people are prepared to kind of make sure that if there's smoke going across the road. Um, also, the signs are important. So when the fire department gets us 350 calls that it looks like something's going up in smoke they'll know and everybody knows you don't have to report it it's under control and it's supposed to be happening at that point go ahead matt summertime like i said before mowing knocking down some of the tall weeds in late spring early summer is important because then you knock the weeds off the native flowers pop right up past it that's when you can also get in and see a lot of the noxious weeds and get them herbicide and knock them out before they go to seed if the noxious weeds go to seed, then you're doing more work and you want to try to hit that early. The biggest port that I like to mention, two things. One, make sure whoever's doing your herbiciding, if it's in-house or out-of-house, that they are fully licensed to do the herbiciding. You don't want things dying or you get killed because you have somebody inexperienced out there. The other big thing is the maintenance records. That'll help you dictate your budget for the next year. If you spend so many hours in one year, you'll know to expect that next year and so forth with chemicals which are going up and fuel. Some of the summer equipment, pretty standard mowers, um, billy goats, weed whippers, that kind of stuff to, to tackle a lot of the tall weeds. Go ahead, Matt. Fall brush. Brush is winter and fall. Uh, fall and winter are great brush time seasons either chipping it or burning it in brush piles. Um, that's the best time to kind of do a lot of this work. Uh, it's a little cooler out, so it's because this is a lot of really heavy, strenuous work. Um, we also, I wanna make a note on the brush. The brush is one of the primary blockers of storm structures. You'll have sandbar willow, like on the top left. That's all the things that love to ground, grow along the water's edge. They'll get into your storm structures, they'll break your pipe. These are the things that you need to get out right away, herbicide them remove them because you'll have long term structural issues if you let some of this brush grow in your detention basins. I'd add brush along, I just add brush along 
creeks and ravines is also a big issue a lot of times um, the canopy of the brush chokes out the light and also you know water nutrients for the ability for the the grasses and sedges and shrubbery to grow along the banks which are a lot more beneficial to help hold those banks in place um, trees don't do a good job the one tree sitting right on the edge of the bank will hold that one spot but everything around it that you know is bare because the vegetation has been choked out um, can can hurt so that's another good reason for the brush clearing that and a lot of people assume that if you have a big tree with a lot of roots it's helping it's not it's not helping at all actually as soon as that tree falls over it rips out the entire seed bank you know like matt said now you got even right, more it's evident by right, my background <laughs> right now you got a tree right exactly right behind you. <laughs> yep. now you have a tree in the water and the sediment in the water and now you got more issues so standard fall equipment everybody's seen you know skid steers with grapple tines they're a must chippers chainsaws once again with chainsaws and chippers and the sequin equipment Please follow all the safety requirements. I can't mention that enough. Please follow all safety requirements to do all the things. Nobody wants to have somebody, I think, was that an old Fargo movie? I don't know if anybody's seen that. I'm to date myself for the guy goes through the chipper. Okay. Yeah, that's that's not good. Not good anywhere. So go ahead, Matt. Good, bad, and ugly. Basically, you know, the, the, the green picture is beautiful, native flowers, grasses mixed in. It's it's not a monocultural flower. There's grasses and flowers mixed in, a couple of trees for habitat, which is nice. Um, top right one basically is just, it's a detention basin that we ended up fixing. It was teasel, it was phragmites, it was a whole bunch of just nothingness, weeds, garbage. Collected a lot of good garbage that got blown in, which is positive because um, then it was easily picked up. And then the bottom is Phragmites, which I think most people have seen along the road, 15 foot high vegetation. The problem with this Phragmites is it creates a mat, one to two feet of like a sponge and holds water, but you cannot get rid of it. It's, it's one of the hardest vegetations to get rid of. And if that starts to take over in your basin, your almost best scenario is to dig it all out. Um, so these are the things that we kind of have to watch about if we have these issues and, and contact maybe a local native maintenance company or us or somebody to maybe help assess it we can give you a nice assessment or somebody can and then you can start to kind of roll on that budgetary scenario roll on to the next one matt so that's basically it obviously we want the turtles and the habitat to move back the picture on the right i don't know if people can identify that picture or not I found Something that used to be illegal. It used to be illegal. It's not illegal anymore. Uh, it's a nice marijuana plant that somebody has taken good care about to put a nice little tomato cage around. Um, so I took this was in a native area and I was you can see it because the plant right to the north of that is a black eyed Susan. So somebody did a really good job in this and then somebody came in and put this nice uh, marijuana plant right in the middle. And and then I started laughing at it and then I realized, oh, crap, this guy might come back. So then I booked out of there. But it's just kind of funny you'll find and I think if I'm not mistaken I think marijuana is a native plant I'm not sure to this area but it is a native species plant so after that any more questions uh, we did have one I'll go back to that question yes. about the uh, sedimentation basin size so um, I, I think we had about a tenth of an acre foot of sedimentation or a volume in that sedimentation basin versus the 65 acre feet foot um, overall basin size. Um, I, I'll qualify that with uh, the sedimentation basin size um, was not specifically designed to any standards. It was more of what could we dig out with our budget? How what you know? How big of what what would make sense to fit in the bottom of that? We didn't want the entire bottom of the reservoir to be a wet bottom we wanted it to have a we wanted it to be a, a you know a, a specific spot within the reservoir so that we could have that you know wetland vegetation throughout the rest of it um, and then the depth was determined you know we, we went to two feet um, deep because we wanted it deep enough that it, it stayed wet bottom and didn't get filled in you know it's, it's deep enough to choke out the some of those wetland plants um, and allow it to stay just open water so the design was more along um you know what what's going to work and fit best in the site 
and work with the city's budget versus compared to what is um, you know the size of the basin versus compared to the size of the sediment basin. Um, there's a all right. Well, about... well, great. Thank you, guys. I, I see there's one other question, um, uh, and it's regarding. It says, uh, "Is there a backup system in the event of a power outage?" For the uh, pump station, it doesn't. Yeah. It. I'm not sure if it has. I think it. There's redundant power sources, but there's not an on-site generator. Um, unlike sanitary um, lift stations, if the event of a power outage. Um, Pumping the reservoir out is not a critical facility. Um, you know, it's it, the the reservoir is there for to to take the peak off of the um, you know highest part of an intense storm. And if the water sits in there for a week or two, the only risk you have is if there's another big back-to-back -back storm. Um, that that was not redundant. You know, some municipalities when designing lift stormwater pump stations want that redundancy and that certainty to help prevent um, upstream flooding. Um, some accept the risk and say, you know, having the generator on site to maybe be used once in 10 years, um, you know, which is about the life cycle of a generator at half a million dollars for that generator isn't worth it. Or they have portable, you know, others might have portable generators that they can bring out. And, you know, these aren't the little Home Depot throw it in your trunk generators. These are, you know, big sits on a trailer its own trailer has wheels on it type of generator. But there's and, not and a how, generator on the site. How about the, you know, just the overall system? Does the overall system, the pumps and the, the gates and the pumping stuff, does that, does that work automatically or is that uh, it, manually operated through like the SCADA system? So it, before this project, it was all manual. Somebody had to drive out there and flip a switch or, or turn a crank to shut the gate. Um, now everything is automated based on rules that we have to, rules that we have defined. So the water gets this high here or there, or the gates open or close, pumps turn on or off, gate closes. So it, it's all set automatically. Um, how all of the public works operators have access to the um, SCADA controls on their phones that control this and all the lift stations and the sanitary facilities and everything around town, they can go in and override everything. Um, you know, so if, if they look and the automatic controls are going and they see something's acting a little weird, they, they don't even have to go to the site. They can go to the, you know, we've got cameras on site. They can go to the cameras, see what's going on. If something doesn't look right, they can, from their phone, override the automated automated controls and say, we need to close this gate or we need to turn on extra pumps or we need to turn off the pumps. Um, you know, maybe it's pushing too much water downstream and causing a new problem um, because the sensor wasn't working or something. So they can override everything. Um, any one of the public works staff with, with the SCADA control authority can override the controls from their phones from anywhere. They can be on vacation in Hawaii, get a little alarm that something, there's a storm, look at it and say, oh, I'm going to turn on that extra pump. That's, yeah, that's, that sounds familiar with the, the operation of our flood control facility. So, so th th there's good and bad with that if you're on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just scanned through the chat box. I, I don't see any more questions. Um, we're, we're basically at the end of our time anyway. So a uh, great job, Matthew and, and, and Colin, uh, for the presentation and answering these questions. Uh, I, I'll, I'll thank you guys one more time, along with Kent, for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Uh, I'd also like to thank our audience for joining us this afternoon. We hope you've learned and uh, uh, enjoyed the webinar and learned a few things from the webinar. Uh, please remember that Mary is going to email everyone with a link to the presentation, uh, a, a recording of the webinar, and that PDH certificate. Uh, keep in mind, uh, our next scheduled webinar is January 13th, where we're going to cover maintenance of green infrastructure best management practices. Uh, so thanks again to everybody. Happy holidays to everyone. Hope you uh, stay safe uh, and have a happy, healthy holiday this year. Uh, thank you very much, and, and we hope to see you on the 13th. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone.